Here's a few words with Jesse Bond of Southwest Fire Academy. Hey, Jesse, give me a rundown of what's going on with SFA. Yeah, so we just finished Boot Camp 50, so we've got some of those new systems in place that we're kind of trialing that went well, and Boot Camp 51 starting next week. We have an EMR and first responder course April 9th to 16th. We're doing our first firefighter survival and RIP program. That'll be May 15th to the 19th. We've done some stuff for departments, but this will be our first open enrollment one. And then we got Mike Tazarski doing Trench Rescue June 5th to 9th. So I'll give you more detail on that later, but it sounds like a pretty exciting one. And then, uh, yeah, we're just locking down some details, but have big news to follow with True North Fools and Southwest Fire Academy working together. So we're excited and looking forward to that. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 62 of Multiple Calls. I'm Scott Hewlett. Despite more information being available on all things firefighting than at any other point in our history, some simply choose to keep working within their narrow beliefs. It can be frustrating for those that want to do their part to help firefighters and the service continue to improve. You can bring the best training and ideas forward in the most palatable way, and it can still get pushed off. That attitude may not be right. It may even be detrimental and dangerous, but you have to be able to accept what people aren't willing to accept. Rule two of the 25 rules for the fire service instructor is that it's not your job to convince anyone. Your job is to remove the excuse of ignorance, including your own. That's the key to keeping yourself engaged and enjoying your time in this career in the way you choose to. It focuses on doing the right thing for the sake of it and hinging on process instead of outcome. Use the overwhelming amount of learning opportunities that are accessible to you to vet and hone your opinions and approach. Offer it to others with respect and focus on walking the talk. The rest is out of your control. Here's part two with Manny. I'd love for us to address the naysayers that look at parking lot drills as not important. They'll chirp and say, well, that's great for parking lot fires, or I'd like to see you do that in a real fire. This seems to be the common refrain from guys that are trying to dismiss having to get out there and do it themselves or the benefit of it. And which is surprising because these same guys will have favorite sports teams and favorite athletes, and they'll be all up in arms about how that team is performing and maybe who the coach is and what kind of practice or preparation they're doing before game day. And they can't perform when the pressure's on and that they can't make that same leap to what they do as being something they're paid to do that does require skill that they do need to practice. Maybe just give me your take on that. With the parking lot, I think that's the price of admission. You can't do it in the parking lot. It's not going to happen in a building. And I think that's where the price of admission is. And you got to pay your dues there for the world to see. It's different from host stretches. Everybody always sees your host stretch. That's there for critiquing. But when it comes to flowing water inside a real house fire, you know nobody's really there looking at what you're doing. They don't know if you're using sound technique or if you're even flowing water, that's an important piece to the whole puzzle. And I look back at my high school career and we didn't go full pads day one. Crawl, walk, run with just helmets and we went about it that way. You didn't just go full pads day one and start hitting each other. We learned the technique. We learned how the coach likes to coach and we went through the process that way. And I don't feel like you can just throw all your gear on, go inside without having done any of the pre-work all the sound techniques, and then just go, hey, let's go flow water inside a building. I don't think it works like that. We got to know the why. We got to know, have some sort of plan to execute keeping the, the water flowing when it's worst case scenario. Because I think if we're not doing that, we're just setting up people underneath us as for failure or setting ourselves up for failure. And I think the parking lot is critical. I think it's not only critical, it's mandatory. And I call it the price of admission because you got to pay your dues there for everybody to see. I think the guys that don't like you know, maybe the, the shift in our approach to fire attack where we're coating all the solids on the way in, I think that comes from a lot of guys that have no maybe history with it or have never seen it work. I've never seen their actions change in actions or change in environment that quick. For them, it seems pointless. And I can understand that, but a lot of them are not in the position where they're even on the nozzle. So they're 
interpretation, unless it's trying to stifle me or stifle the growth of this changing way of attacking fire. And I think had they, or if they knew all the facts that came with it, they would want me to do it if it was their house on fire. And I don't know if ignorance is the word. I just think it's maybe lack of education on their part, but the results don't lie and the research out there doesn't lie. And for me, I have a huge vested interest that I show up to one of my family's house or even, God forbid, one of my family's house or my house. But I do treat every fire like, what if it was my kids in there? What would what would I want the fire department to do? And I know that flowing, when it calls for it, early is the way to go, early and often. So much so that I made sure I hammered in my head that binary of, if it's this, then you should be doing this. If, if you can't see, you should be flowing water. And I like that it's become more automatic than anything as of late. And I want to keep it that way by staying sharp and making sure I still get the reps in and to where it's automatic because I do feel it's a diminishing skill. If you haven't touched the hose in a year or whatever, it's, it's, you're going to be rusty at it. Your muscles aren't going to be used to it. Tendons aren't going to be used to it. You got to, got to get in the position, practice like you play. And there's a certain way to go about it. We don't just go with full gear on right away. We work up to it and it's almost like a hills and valleys we go back to bunker gear and no bunker coat no ba and flowing water like that for a good while and make sure we get it in till we jump back up again and put gear on and on air and getting after it and i think that's important and i would say that you can't do it in the parking lot you're you're not just gonna magically be able to do it in a real building and that's the worst case scenario getting on your knee flowing and moving it's worst case scenario, but if you can do that, you can always throttle back down from that where maybe you're not on your knee or you're, you're standing up. But if you never work on it, it's not a skill that you're just going to magically have when the worst case scenario comes. So detractors or whatnot, I, I just think that if they knew better, maybe they would agree with why I'm doing it. And I think I've gotten better at, at maybe not letting it affect me or affect what we do because the results speak for themselves. And when we go to fires, we, we're, we're pretty good at applying water on the way in and making our environment more tenable. And you just had that happen on a fire recently. Oh, yeah. I'd say two fires in the last two weeks or so, flowing and moving and looking at the benefits, applying water for the wind, like Aaron Field says, flow water for the wind, baby. And, and I tried to even simplify it further, you know. When in doubt, open it up. Only good things are going to happen. And I do that for the guys that maybe don't have a lot of experience with fires and maybe a little hesitant that, well, what do I do? If you don't know what to do and you feel like things are getting worse, open it up. Matter of fact, it's never too early to start flowing. If it looks like heavy chugging smoke, light it up, grip it and rip it and don't stop till the fire's out if at all possible. I know that's not always possible and I know guys don't like absolutes, but we try to stick to that and I know that there's always contingencies, there's always hoarder homes and stuff like that, but normal people don't put stuff in the way where they're trying to get in and out of their main egresses, so that theory kind of holds true, and one of the things I like to, I wanted to say the other day on the scrap, I didn't get a chance to, there was a lot of things I felt I could have done better, but just because it's an outlier doesn't mean it disproves the rule. A lot of these rules and these adages hold true for what we do, and when it's a curveball thrown at you, preparing for the worst case scenario is is the best way to go. When you said curveball there, it made me think of, well, if you can't hit a slow thrown fastball straight down the plate, how are you going to expect to hit a curveball? A great thing that you said there, I heard Jay Bonifield say as well, was if you see this, do this. That's locked into my brain now whenever I'm trying to pass anything on to anybody. It's in that model of as, as opposed to all the negatives, right? All the things to avoid, all the things to worry about. It's more of, if you see this, do this. It becomes a very automatic decision-making process. I think it makes us more effective. Like instead of getting locked up with indecision, it makes our decision-making model a lot faster. And there's already so many pieces going on, literally thousands of moving pieces to get you to that fire. You don't need to make it more complicated. Make it simple and make it effective and open up earlier rather than later and good things are going to happen. I truly believe that and simplicity for me always reigns supreme and that's why I try to approach everything that we do. If it's too complicated or there's more than three motions to it, it's like, well, is that really going to work? It's like doing a halo with uh, your webbing to sling up a down victim when it's like, hey man, would it be more effective to just grab the person and remove them life over limb and 
get them out of that IDLH environment when you got to move 15, 20 feet? Or is it more important that you use that 30 step process technique to get them out there? And I just always try to use that approach when going to fires, just simplicity reigns supreme for me. Especially when we know that when you're under stress and pressure, you lose fine motor skills. So anything you're going to have to do that's going to have to involve pulling a small piece of rope or, or webbing out of your gear and tying a knot, you're not going to be able to do it unless you've practiced it regularly under pressure in that environment. It's not going to be something that's going to flow as easily as it does when you're in a well-lit bay floor and there's no risk associated with it. When you're staring at a fire and you do your drop for your hose stretch, your fine motor skills that we talked about are gone. Are you going to be able to find the right folds? Are you going to be able to, what are you going to do? Like you can't just give up. So one of the things we do is the dirty drop. And I know I've posted videos before on it and I, I do it just because it gives us something to fall back on. And if you prefer a different stretch, it's okay. But what's going to happen when things go bad or you trip or you fall, or it's not a clean drop and you don't want to take the extra 15 seconds to make sure you have the right folds but you got to go now what are you going to do and how are you going to make it work and for me the dirty drop is making it as effective as simple as we can it's not perfect but it works every time and it's one thing we kind of push the guys and that's the first thing we show them but we say hey you're going to have guys that show you this beautiful lay and you're going to have a guy that sh shows you the beautiful way to do it but i'm showing you because i care enough to know to tell you when things go wrong what are you going to do you have to make it work. This is what you can fall back on at three in the morning with low visibility. You got fire. You have people yelling at you. How do you still make it work? I'd be lying if I said I always do the dirty drop. That is my go-to. But this last fire, you know, I did a forward, forward accordion and it worked. I had the space for it. But what if I didn't? I knew I had something to fall back on. And that's one thing I've always tried to use in training is the simplicity and drilling for effectiveness and making it as simple as possible. That common sense approach, I think, is the way to go about everything. Well, it's easy for people to see something and dismiss it completely because they think it won't work in every single situation, as opposed to seeing something, seeing other variations of it, trying it themselves, trying other variations themselves, and then finding something in that that works for them and then applying it and then seeing how it works. Not a lot of people want to take that long approach to mastering a skill for themselves i go with the fact too that we have a big demand for a wide array of skills that we need to know as frontline firefighters and i understand that just because this probe is here this day that he's not going to be getting the same training or going over the same stuff when he rotates or he or she rotates to another district or station so we try to harp on the basics the things that are going to benefit them give them the biggest benefit for their time and effect, be as effective as we can with it. We know that fighting fire isn't all we do. A lot of it's heavily leaned towards EMS, but going to fires is the most critical thing we do. So we try to show them like, hey, when you go to fires, you want to be effective. And I tell them when they come here, sorry, like we get a fire, you're not on the nozzle. Like that's a critical position. It's the most critical position on the entire fire ground. And I don't usually like to leave that up to the least experienced person so they were here longer term and we had a few fires under our belt then we could start leaning towards like let's get you some experience on the nozzle with me being right on their back trying to make sure they're doing the right thing but we try to stray away from that some places are different i don't necessarily agree with it but i don't have power over that so when they're here we try to treat them like they were our probably the whole time and make sure that we start from scratch and ground zero and make sure that we get after it. Can you describe the dirty drop for me? Obviously, people can go online and find the videos you've put up, but can you maybe just give a description here if people are thinking, what is that? I'm sure I've seen somebody do it before and they call it something else, but I call it the dirty drop just in case you do your drop and it doesn't, the folds aren't for reverse accordion or split V or whatever, and it's not clean. Or when you're trying to do a two up, one down, or some new fad that's out there to do a reverse lay from your point of attack where you drop the nozzle and stretch backwards. I don't like seeing guys fidget with hose when they're on their approach to the fire. I'd rather have their head up looking at the fire and spend the least amount of brain cells on what their hose stretch is going to be. And even the most skilled firefighter on hose deployments is still they're going to do one of those they might be looking down as they're on their approach instead of taking in those extra seconds of those terabytes of information on what's going on 
I think the firefighter should do their own personal size up as we approach the building. What are we looking for? You know, the layout of the building, where's the door oriented, the fastest moving smoke, things like that. So the least amount of time or where I can mess around with the hose stretch, the better. So the dirty drop is either a flat load inverted or a minute man. It doesn't matter. It can be done with any hose lay, any hose lay that you carry on your shoulder. You go to your point of attack about five feet off so that forcible entry firefighter or crew that comes up to help has room to work. We drop there. Unlike some of the videos we've done where the firefighter just kind of throws it to the ground really hard, which we try to stray from, it's a drop. Drop it as cleanly as you can. If it doesn't drop cleanly because you either tripped or fell, now you just start shooting for your identifiers. The biggest identifiers would be your couplings. We shortened it up to where you only need about seven steps to pull back away from your point of attack. And we try to hone in and we try to be real strict with Look where you're going instead of walking backwards because I've seen a lot of guys trip and it's a bad recipe for injuries and and whatnot. And some of these houses, the front lawn is filled with stuff. And so when we're backstretching that coupling away from the point of attack, we whip it, bring it back with us and we pick a side. We don't feed our supply over our attack. We try to position it on one side or the other. And after that, we're ready to go. We call for water. We instill it in our probies or anybody that comes that we're going to cycle the nozzle three times for for kinks I look behind us check for the stream pattern and how it looks and once we do that we're ready to go and for us we found that it takes the least amount of brain power we can focus our energy and our incoming information on what's going on in the building we try to focus on i had time the last part to do a forward accordion so i just did it it was a straight shot from the fence and worked out pretty good Are you a fan of building the loops at all? Have you ever used that? Would you ever use it, say, in a more confined space where you don't have room to stretch back or forward? I would. I've never done it at a fire, but I'm not a big fan. I've seen a lot of other training, trainings that I've been to where they kind of push that. And it wasn't until Kyle Ramagus kind of told me, he's like, hey, but think about it. He goes, for every turn, that's friction loss built into it. And I'm like, boom, the light went off in my head. I was like, whoa. So every time that nozzle's advanced for the pressure that it took to overcome those turns in the hose, you're going to get a bump in pressure for every time it's straightened out. Instead of getting your normal 59 pounds of nozzle reaction, you're gonna, it's going to start increasing as you start deploying it and, and advancing it. So that's why I'm not a huge fan. It's all that inherent friction loss. And the goal was always in going with these better hoses and better nozzles that are, have lower operating pressure was to reduce nozzle reaction. But we've kind of done away with that by that one hose deployment or one hose style of deployment. I'm not a huge fan. As much as I can stay away from it, I will. I know how to build the bundle, uh, make it pretty simple. And I've seen harder ways of it being done. And that's why I think Aaron Fields calls it the very last resort. Don't make it your first option. Make it your last resort because if you have no room, and he even says it, I've only done it twice in my career. I'm not the biggest fan, but if I ever need to use it, I know it's there. We don't work on it a whole lot, but we make sure that we touch on it and, t- and give those caveats of, hey, this isn't, this shouldn't be your go-to for X, Y, Z reasons, but it's something you still have if you ever need it. Yeah, it's really more of a limited space option. If you've got a enclosed porch or something where you can't stretch back. For whatever reason, you stretch on a balcony off of a ladder or whatnot. I mean, there are scenarios where... For sure, it seems like it would be a a good tool to use, but for the most part, I've never needed to use it, and I understand the drawbacks of using it if we we did need to use it. There would need to be a drop in pump discharge pressure at some point. Let's touch back on what you said before about keeping your head up and being able to take in other information. So this ties back as well to the benefit of mastering a skill that becomes second nature to you, like riding a bike. So... I think about watching my daughters ride their bike with gears for the first time and they're looking down at the gears while they're shifting and they're not paying attention to what's in front of them and they almost run into a parked car, for example. For me, it's the same thing, right? It's the, you must find when you're first teaching guys to flow and move that their their stream is still, that it doesn't move because they're really focused on what their lower body's doing. And then as they start to master the lower body and how they're holding onto the hose next thing they can do is now they can start moving the stream. So I guess this is where it's all going, right? That 
you have to master those body movements so that you don't think about it at all. It just becomes what you do. And now you're taking in all this, every fire is different information that the guys are harping about. I think fires are more alike than they are different. And I know that's not really what we're talking about. So when we teach flowing and moving, we tell them, hey, don't worry about your stream. Let's get the mechanics down. If your mechanics fail, your water mapping is definitely going to fail. So we work on body mechanics first. I tell them, don't worry about where your water's going right now when we're outside in the parking lot. That's another drawback. Let's say we start off in a burn building. You're going to look at where your water's going. You're going to see what happens. And that's almost too much information for day one, water mapping plus body mechanics. Like I think that's a training scar, in my opinion. That's why we have to start in the parking lot, working on your body movements, your body mechanics, and making sure we find a position that's comfortable for you. We focus on the camella because it is a really good use of our time to gain a skill acquisition and be effective with it because there's that likelihood of going to a fire that day. And so when we work on that skill, we try to find, and I always ask them, is that comfortable? Be honest with me. And if they tell me no, then we're going to adjust something. We're going to make it comfortable. And I always tell them, if it's not comfortable, you're not going to do it. And if it is, you are. So we try to to work on that position of comfort for them when they're flowing. And we crawl, walk, run. We work on just the position. Then we work up to getting ready to flow and move and getting back into position again, posturing up, then posturing back down. And we do that for a little while, then we start working gradually up to using our body's leverage to flow and move. I've had a lot of success. It does take work. Nozzle work is not easy. A lot of times there's that, I don't know if we can call it fear, but from guys that maybe have dealt with those 100 PSI or 75 PSI nozzles that just kick your butt, and then on top of that, never being showed a technique that works and i know not to bash on any of the instructors i had but we never there was never really a focus on technique it was just grab that pistol grip open it up but i knew something was off because you know i'm 200 plus pounds 220 pounds getting kind of pushed back because the nozzle is just too much pressure it just didn't seem right i was like man there's got to be another way and i'm going to good classes and learning different ways and feeling what i, I would feel would be effective to push to the masses here where I'm at and trying to make us a little bit more effective. And I felt like we've gained a lot of traction, but I do feel like maybe that was one reason too with, oh, that's just too much work. And I think in their eyes, it's all about maybe effectiveness is their word they're looking for. Like that's not effective when in all reality it is. And it can be gained, a skill that can be gained if you put work into it. But I find a lot of times the tractors or guys that are not even in a position where it would benefit them. Maybe they're in a position where they stay outside or they're not the ones actively doing this, that skill or that task at a fire. And I feel that a lot of times the ones that are in a position, even if they got a lot of time in service and they're in that position where it still at demands them that they are on the nozzle position, I found that they're pretty attentive. And I've had a lot of good feedback, like, man, this is good. I wish I would have known this years ago. And that makes me feel good. It also makes me feel bad. Like, I I wish these skills were available when they first started off and could have pushed them on us a little bit. And maybe we would have had a little bit of a leg up instead of playing this huge catch-up game that we're playing as a fire service. And I think that's, it's fire service wide. It's not just where I'm at. I think we've gone light years in just a short amount of time. Yeah, I think the ironic thing is when guys think, well, this is too much work, is that they don't understand that learning these techniques and skills and being able to handle a line effectively actually makes the job easier, right? And then in that moment, then what what do you have? Then you have an opportunity to not exert as much effort to think about controlling your breathing, to relaxing your body, to slowing down, which slows your heart rate, which opens up your bandwidth to think better and maybe gain some of those fine motor skills back. I think that's a real missing piece with people not wanting to put the effort in to learn these techniques. And I'm really curious if this happened for you, that once you went down this rabbit hole of realizing what you should have, could have, would have known about flowing, did you have the, obviously then you realize, well, nozzles are important, well, hose is important, well, the pump pressure is important. And then you obviously expand into other things. Well, did you have the same experience with ladders and force entry? Like, what else don't I know? 
and all of a sudden you feel like you're on the back foot and you got a lot of catching up to do on all fronts. I want to say I had it front loaded when we came in. I was like, man, I got to know all this stuff. It's all important, which it, it is all important, but I think there's also tears to it. And through going to training, I kind of realized that there's a big five out there and trying to focus on those because now you you have a firm grasp on reality. Like, okay, learning this obscure tool or technique or skill isn't as important as these that are going to get me 99% of the way there. And it just makes more sense to start here and work my way up because I don't feel like we should be doing RIT day one. I'm not a fan of doing RIT day one. I know people have talked, you know, it's a good way of acquiring skills, but maybe it's the wrong way to look at it. But I want to prepare to win instead of preparing for what we're going to do when we fail. And not only that, if we're preparing to win and we're still trying to win when we're ever encountered with a situation like RIT, we'll still win if we're doing the basics right, the water flowing water and getting all that first line right. I'm a real big proponent of never losing sight of attack. And if we do it right, those situations will actually be even less encounter, much less. I'm a huge proponent on starting somewhere. Start at the most important. And I got that from Aaron Fields, him talking about do what you do at fires, start there. And that was kind of an aha moment for me. It's like, okay. Like I had never heard that. He frames it as the possible versus the probable. Exactly. When I heard it, it was an aha moment for me. And I was like, okay. Now, now I can start working towards something. Now I can start making it make sense to me and I can start putting my energy and focus more one singular thing instead of all of it all the time because I'm not a big fan of all of it all the time. We go in through cycles. We do get EMS training all the time by doing and we also go through our continuing education. But for fire, there's really nothing like that. So we got to keep each other honest and that's been my mission is just making sure for me, for one, so that I'm effective at my job, but also spreading it. So maybe if it helps somebody else, I'm more than happy to keep doing it and, and just keep spreading the word and information. And if somebody wants to train with me, I'm more always more more than happy. There's never been a probie that comes through here that didn't get some type of training. And that's something I hang my hat on. And if, if I missed them, I made sure I for sure got back with them and, and worked with them and I've done that since I was at my last company and it's something I hope to keep doing and keep passing on these little tidbit of knowledge that I know and hopefully it helps them at a fire. Hopefully they're never in a position where they get scared straight, kind of like I did, getting scared straight because things could have gone really, really bad and they didn't, not wanting that to happen again to anybody else. And that's what I feel maybe started me on this path of wanting to spread this information because Anybody that knows me knows that I'm passionate about it. And I'm telling them almost with tears in my eyes that do this. I'm telling you, get good at this because when it's smoky and it's hot and you're not on the nozzle and somebody else is that's incompetent, I go, then you'll know. Then you'll know. And I don't want you to get to that point. So we all got to know this. We all got to be on the same sheet of music. Just recently, one of the things we were talking about was anybody can call it. Like if you feel... The nozzle should be open, call it. I feel like everybody is well within their right inside the compartment. If you feel like water should have been flown you know, a few seconds before or a minute before and it's not getting done, then I feel anybody is well within their rights to say open it up. I know I've done it when I wasn't on the nozzle and you know, I was on a truck crew or whatever, just because I know the benefits that come with it and knowing that only good things are going to happen. Yeah, I think it's better to quickly realize that you opened up too soon or that you might not have to flow as long as you thought that you might have had to versus not pulling the trigger and then realizing very quickly that you should have and it's too late. And you can't, well, I've heard it framed as you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, it's better to err on the side of flowing water early than the other way around. One of the things, oh, we're going to run out of water. And I like that UL put their numbers on total gallonage usage and I think it just further propels us to use tank water and how effective that can be. And my last two fires on the nozzle, we killed them with one tank. I think that's the goal from now on is try to only use one tank to get full extinguishment, making sure that we can get full extinguishment with one tank. If not, hopefully call for a second tank to tie us in and, and use their water, be more effective and you know, be a force mo multiplier, so to speak. And I think that is something I'd like to see kind of get pushed a little bit more and we used to do something similar back a few years ago 
double attack supply, which is essentially almost the same thing. Your force multiplier and bringing your water into the fight instead of hanging back and maybe catching a supply on your second do. But for sure, I, that's something I'd like to see done and at least us go to or ship to. And you've mentioned the the big five, and I think you and I have had a, a chat via text over that maybe we should even add strong BLS skills as the sixth that, that I think never gets talked about back to my career so far. And I've definitely saved a lot more lives with the BVM than I ever have with the hose line. So adding those basics of knowing how to manage an airway, how to suction, how to bag properly, how to stop bleeding, these key things that are going to affect people's lives within the first couple minutes. I think we all do love to talk about the basics when it comes to actual fire ground skills, but we do all these things because people are involved and we also go to a lot more med calls than we go to anything else. So hammering those home are just as important. We went to school for EMT basics and I had to do that with myself too on trying to frame it in, okay, for trauma, what are the things we're looking for and tourniquet the extremities, uh, pack the junctions and seal the chest and the torso and just things like that to make it even more simpler for me and effective like for those type of calls. I think is a another force multiplier when we show up and it's a trauma call and we do get a lot of experience. I can sit here and tell you a lot of cases where I've used those basic skills and they've come in handy. And for sure, I would say strong BLS is important. We're there for victims. And a lot of times if we pull them out and they're not breathing, we can't just stop and say, oh, our EMS division will take care of that. And that's not the case. And we got to go right to work. You mentioned before about when you get rookies in and they might be getting different training elsewhere. And it also made me think of just recruit classes, right? And training in general, I think one of the biggest challenges in the fire service overall is not every department's dealing with the same staffing, the same allocation of resources like props and time given to them to actually train their firefighters. And they do have to quote unquote, check all the boxes that the person was quote unquote trained on everything that they should know. If a department only has six weeks, maybe they only have two. We know you could easily fill 20 or 24 weeks and properly rep out everything and you would have a much more robust, functional rookie when they came out of the class. But that's not always possible. So really what the dirty little secret, I guess, is, and it's necessary, it's, it's not like someone's doing this malevolently, but you only have so much time and you have this dump of information you got to download onto these brand new recruits. So there's got to be a lot of training scars or just being overwhelmed or saturated when you don't even really get to get a feel for these basics. So my point is just to support what you're saying and maybe get your more of your take on it too, is why it's important to, for crews and for individuals to, after that's all said and done, not to forget everything that you were taught in training, because I think that's a bad thing to say, but okay, well, let's look back at the basics of what you were being shown there and hone in on those and take the time and take it upon ourselves to be accountable to actually make sure that we learn the skills and then not just address the fact that we were shown them. I think it's important also to kind of hark back and describe the big five as well and what they are and why they even exist and flowing and moving and throwing ground ladders, forcible entry search, or making sure that we're pretty solid in those big five. And the reason they exist is because they're the most probably used skills at a fire. And we try to make sure we touch on those just to always have a firm grasp on that. They say tying knots is a diminishing skill, but so is forcible entry if you don't do it often. And we try to make sure that obviously the probies have a checkbook, a checklist of things that they got to go over. I like it. It keeps them honest. That they got to keep on top of things. But on top of that, we try to push those basic skills as much as we can because they're the ones that are going to be the most beneficial for them when they go to fires. Because if we know they can do those and they're proficient at them, we can ask them to do pretty much anything that is a fire ground basic because it's the most important. And there's a reason why they're the basics. We try to go through their book and see what they haven't done. We touch on a few of those, but we also touch on what we feel is very crucial for them to understand and know. I do get how EMS is 90% of our runs, but 90% of those calls aren't as crucial as maybe they, they're made out to be. And when we do go to fires, dozens of people's lives are hinging on things going right and being effective at going interior. And not to mention the reason we're there in the first place, those civilians that are in there, they're going to require BLS when we get them out. 
So we try to frame it all and, and not be uh, pessimistic about, well, EMS gets all the attention and fire doesn't because really they're, they're both important. There's a reason why we do them. And I truly believe in being good at both, making sure we touch on it. Just fact of the matter is, is I'd say there's no place that goes to more fires than they do EMS runs. So the deal with, with that is we stay sharp because we do it fairly often, EMS runs. And it just so happens where I'm at, we do go to a lot of fires and it's one of the reasons why I came and I love it. I get to put into practice what we work on and see the fruit of our labor and see an immediate benefits of our hard work. And you mentioned RIT too. I think that's another great example of something that departments say that they have or they have got the documentation to say that they have it. They have the bags on the truck. But again, the time that it takes to allocate to properly train your people so that they are actually effective as a RIT team. I'm not sure that's as common as we think it is. You look at the thousand maydays from Michael Snodgrass, just looking at that data and how long it takes. And they knew they were doing RIT, so they were hydrated. They were ready to go and still looking at the times that it took and the lack of effectiveness that it was. It was troublesome for me and it, it, it made me even lean heavily on being, let's, let's plan to win instead of what are we going to do when we fail? I don't believe that's a pessimistic way. But it's, it's a part of us having these honest conversations with ourselves and with each other. And what are we really doing? Where, where is our time? Should we be doing department-wide RIT drills with each other? Or should we be putting a little bit more emphasis on the basics and being very proficient at those? And we've gone through both. And I mentioned it before. I'm, I'm really proud that our department, we have a uh, minimum company standards of stretching that first attack line and then running a horizontal standpipe or a extended lay it's called different things many places but those two plays in our playbook are pretty important we can do a lot with just those two and making sure we're bringing out companies and keeping them honest and not making it a punishment thing but making it a learning opportunity and us recommending hey i know you tried it this way but let's try it this way and getting a lot of good feedback from that yeah my mentioning of it was more of the just the acknowledgement of something that is important, that is nuanced and difficult, crucial. But just like these other basics, departments say that they've shown that they've trained their members on it, but that they haven't actually been given the time or space to do that, to become truly effective at it. So I just think it's a common thing within the service where departments think that their members are effective on a lot of topics and they possibly aren't. And then maybe there's even that false sense of security where members, and I even include myself, right? We we all think we're better than we actually are. I remember hearing that recently too, and that stuck with me very strongly. And that we don't get the opportunity to fail often enough. It's something that we think we're good at to have that moment where we realize we need to put more time in. I think we've had better feedback by not making it punishment-based with the training we have and making it more of a learning environment and the big thing that we've kind of gathered is these firefighters i'd say more than 90 percent of them us are go-getters and we don't like looking bad we don't like failing we don't like showing our ass so to speak so when they fail at something that everybody's looking at and nobody needs to call them out on it it's self-evident and that's what we tried to make it like let's not make it worse by hey, we're, you took this long to do the deployment or, or you didn't do this right or whatever. Instead, it's like we're hard on ourselves more so than anybody else is hard on us. And it's self-evident. And you could tell the crews that felt like they could have done better and they for sure don't want to have it happen again. And if it's really egregious, we bring them back. But we've found that we've, got, we've gotten a lot of better feedback. And one of the things I've maybe not touched on or talked about is trying to win guys over with not being so brash like we know it all and i speak kind of from the instructor point of view and i think that goes a long way these guys and girls that are on these crews are the ones you're going to go to fires with and if you come across that as a know-it-all which i've done in the past and I, i really didn't like myself doing it and i've kind of grown just in those short few years being around a lot of different training events or whatnot and trying not to be that guy and that you're going to win over, you know, calling them out. That call out culture, I think, is what I was trying to get at. That call out culture. You're not being as disciplined as I am because you're not training, you're not, you know, doing this the way I'm doing it. And it's like, we're not going to win anybody over. And I know there's some guys you're just never going to get to. But for me, as of late, I call it the call out culture. It's just 
puts a bad taste in my mouth. I, I really don't care for it. And I, maybe I was a part of it at the beginning and I kind of evolved to where I self realization that I didn't want to be that guy going out and training and, and being proud of myself, but it doesn't come across like that. Sometimes it comes across as very crass and you feeling like maybe you're superior when you're not. And it comes across elitist. And I really, really despise that and kind of self-evident that maybe it wasn't my intention, but it came across that way and maybe pushed a lot of guys off what we were doing when it didn't need to go down like that. There's a better way. I call it weaponizing accountability where I'm more accountable than you because I went and trained more. And it's like, that's not what we should be doing. And I feel as of late, maybe that's been a different angle that I'm trying to maybe approach with trying to bring in more guys to be accepting and open to some of the stuff that I've been talking about because I've had a lot of pushback and I think most of it is just a misunderstanding. And I think we can win more people over if we just went about it a little bit different. And I say we, I mean me and a lot of the guys that feel that there's a different wave of being competent and things like that. But I think guys that are in position to spread the word of training and new stuff, just be very, very careful and maybe don't go down that same road like I went. We're trying to hold other people accountable when we're all going to the same fires and they should be maybe at a certain level, but you're not going to make them want to do it voluntarily. And that's the best way to have somebody get better is for them to find it in themselves that they maybe have some shortcomings. And I think a good way to do that is having these trainings that are self-evident and them seeing the deficiencies and maybe not have us even point them out. And I've seen companies do really, really well come second go around. And I found maybe that's a sweet spot to approach it with future trainings and make it enjoyable, non-punishing, where it's not punitive. And I know Aaron Fields, again, talked about it. Don't ever make training punitive or where it's punishment-based. And that kind of stuck out to me. And for sure, I've, I've tried to make it fun and enjoyable and not push so hard on, hey, you need to learn this technique or be off-putting. I think it's a common thing when people, let's just say someone becomes enlightened. Let's just go that far. Someone becomes enlightened. Say you're 50 years old and you achieve enlightenment, and then you're going to look back and instantly expect everybody else around you in the world to become enlightened immediately because now you are. And you're forgetting then all those 50 years that you weren't and all the times you had the opportunity to achieve that pinnacle and you didn't take it, all the shortcomings you had, and then the path it took you to get to that achievement. So it's forgetting where you came from or having the the honesty to look back at what your path was and then maybe just try and make it easier and fast track people to the point where you're at. I think it's also okay to be confident that you know some things about some things. You obviously know some things about flowing and moving water. That's okay to know that you know that and to pass it on and to also have that humility that you don't know all of it yet. Like I've spent a lot of time doing it as well. And I just recently watched Jay Bonifield's Anatomy of a Push. It immediately made me want to go back out and start flowing more water because I picked up three, four, five, I don't know, 10 things. I'm like, ah, I'm going to tweak that. I'm going to tweak that. Right. So even in that moment before clicking on that presentation where I thought I was confident and had quote unquote, had it down and had my way, as soon as I'm better, I'm going to be going back to the drawing board and trying to make some adjustments to get even better at it. So we're never really done. So I think as long as you're aware that you know some things about some things, and but you also know that you don't know all things about all things, and the people that you're around understand that, like you said, you're just delivering the information and showing the skill, and the skills themselves are going to do the talking. It's a never-ending process, like you said, and I always approach it as everybody's shit stinks, and the moment people feel like we're better than somebody else or whatnot, I, I think that's very off-putting, and fortunately, in our line of service, that gets called out pretty fast, and Maybe that's what happened with me getting like, hey, man, you're, you're going about it a little bit wrong. You need to adjust your message because coming off a little bit off-putting or elitist. And it's like I mentioned before that that elitism where self-importance, that confidence can be very, very closely related to that if you're not careful about it. For me, I feel very confident, but we can always learn more and we can always get better. And But we have to also be careful and mindful of it's not a one-man show, it's not a one-crew show. We all have to work together and very good thing and that I like about my department is surrounded by professionals that really want to be good at this job. And for the longest time, there was no 
emphasis on some of the stuff we're talking about but now i feel like we're gaining traction there's enough guys saying it seeing the results and getting a little bit of exposure for trying to do the right thing in the right way and i feel like we're moving in the right direction and i'm i couldn't be more pleased and to see that a lot of the messages i get from guys around the department and wanting little tips or clarification on things and for me wanting to simplify it for myself i feel has been easier to explain it for to other people and one of the things einstein said if you can't explain it simply then you don't understand it when it comes for me for fire dynamics and whatever water mapping and air entrainment i always felt i had to dumb it down for myself to really really get it and explain it in the simplest terms and one of the things that i i like is when i explain it to somebody and they say well yeah just like this and it's like oh, yeah i'm glad it actually resounded with them and it was taken really easily and it was understood and that's always been the mission and i think we need more of that for sure yeah one thing i go back to consistently is that we need to be able to talk about things professionally without taking it personally if we're going to talk about this all the way through then we also have to understand that the people saying that well you were going about it the wrong way possibly you were i mean that's our part to own that side of things if we were really legitimately going about it the wrong way or coming across harsh then that's for us to own. But what I want to also talk about is the other side of the coin where maybe even the same people that are very commonly saying that people are snowflakes and get too easily offended and they they get butthurt or on and on and on. It's like, hold on a second. (laughs) So you're trying to bring something forward and it's very easy for the naysayers to say, you were coming across the wrong way, so I don't have to receive that, right? They can shut down very easily. On both sides, there needs to be this professional discussion and professional understanding, professional accountability, that you're going to do your best to deliver it in the quote unquote, the right way. But people also have to give a little bit of grace, right? And not just use it as an excuse to push off what they could or should know because the wind didn't blow quite the way that they wanted it to. I think it's another easy out for people sometimes. I think there was guys I was just never going to reach or just never, they just didn't want to hear it for whatever reason. And Through attrition, it's going to come anyway. I feel like flowing and moving or at least being heavier handed on the water is a best practice and can't be denied. The studies, we can't just cherry pick them when it benefits something that we like or something that we can make and turn into a rule real easily. They don't lie. Can they be misinterpreted sometimes? Yeah, but the proof is in the pudding too. And for me, fortunately, we've been able to prove it. We don't always win, but when the tables are set up, for us to win, we do, and I just think that through attrition and can't be avoided anymore where this is effective, and it's sim- as simple as we can make it without too many moving parts and too many little tidbits where you got to do it this way or that way or setting it up in a box. I think we're going to win, and for me, a win would be it'd be widely understood that flowing water earlier rather than later is the way to go and making it as simple as possible with that binary action of if you can't see, start flowing, and I'd like us to see it. For sure, we do it, and I've tried to spread the word, and guys have been fighting fire in my area longer than I've been alive, and it, also approaching that with respect, and what's been real eye-opening for me is some of these guys, I've, I've talked about one that has 30 years on the nozzle at one of the busiest houses in San Antonio for fires. He's gone to more fires, I'm willing to bet, than anybody west of the Mississippi. I say that with confidence. This guy's gone to more fires than I can ever dream of on the nozzle. He was willing to be open-minded to a lot of this stuff. And I thought if he can get down and dirty and start doing him and his captain, doing the techniques and being receptive to it, I was like, man, nobody has an excuse. These guys are willing to do it and gone to more fires than most of the department. I think everybody should be open-minded to it and I feel it's an educational thing and an approach thing too, but we're professionals. We should be out there seeking the best that's out there, the best way to approach fires for sure. I just felt like there was a void and it needed to be kind of filled in. And that's where I tried to attack aggressively, but maybe finesse was what was needed and also being mindful of people's tenure and whatnot. But I think it's a two-way street, just like you said. Guys have to be professional enough to know that we don't know everything. Yeah, and it's not about thinking you know what's right and, and saying that what was ever done before was wrong, because obviously we're here. Obviously, people have been trying, people have been doing solid, good work up until this moment. 
But as we learn more information, as we learn new things, why wouldn't we apply it and get better? And there's going to be people in 15, 20 years that are going to expand and improve on the work is being done right now. Like that's no shame on us for not being aware of what we we should have, would have, could have done. It's we're doing the best we can at the time. And like you said, respect to the people that were doing the best they could at the time. It's it's more of just that, that growth mindset and of constantly improving. Otherwise, we'd still have bucket brigades. Like why, if we're really going to be purists, why don't we go all the way back to that? Why are we doing what we're doing now? I think we need to look at our history and where we came from. And then I think that, again, takes the ownership of the instructor trying or the person that's passionate about something trying to push something different and being accused of saying the way it's always been done before is wrong. It's not about that. It's about improving. And I mean, I love the fact that we're arguing in the fire service about what's more important, search for flow and water or the constant engine work versus truck work and what needs to happen first. And obviously when we show up to a fire, everything needs to happen and it all needs to happen 10 minutes ago. If we're all fighting about what needs to be done first, I mean, a lot of shit's going to get done. But for us to say that nothing's important and we'll just figure it out when we get there, I think that's what we're trying to avoid. And I agree. I think we've come really far in a short amount of time, but also we're standing on the shoulders of giants that were doing it. And that's the way it was said to be. That's the way they knew it had to be done. And a lot of it was through trial and error. I think trial and error is important. And that anecdotal information is important too. I've had guys tell me blue in the face like why fog works and fog works and it's like maybe in those situations it worked and maybe it's still something we should never lose sight of like in an attic space where wide fog patterns are going to be your unoccupied spaces where that's going to be the most beneficial way of extinguishing those hard egg not fires and still having those and you know those experiences that are going to benefit us Later on, like I love, I'm a student of history. I love learning the history of my department because it's so rich and hearing the old stories and the legends that came and they're out now. And I love hearing that. And it's just making sure that the new stuff that's coming out doesn't try to tarnish their legacy because now we're learning new stuff. And like you said, maybe 10, 20 years, we're going to find out new information that might tell us something different. And I think too, that's A lot of the feedback that I got that was justified when we were trying to do a lot of these things we were doing out in the parking lot, getting laughed at, was, man, we're always shown some new gadgets, some new way of doing it, and this is going to pass. There's always something different, and it's like if we put all our eggs in that basket now, and what if we drop it, and now there's this other different way on how to do it, and I was like, hmm. I go, okay. I was like, yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from when some of that feedback I was getting and I was like, all right, I can respect that, but at least give it a chance. Hopefully this will benefit you at a fire or one of the things we're talking about or the fire dynamics will make sense in a way that maybe it didn't before or whatnot. Yeah. I think that argument is weak when then nothing is brought forward or defended as what does work. So I think it's common when people want to institute change in their department whether it's tactics or tools, that they have to have, it has to be irrefutable, bulletproof. There has to be facts and data and anecdotal, and you need to have everything. You, you, there has to be no chinks in the armor whatsoever. But the people that are arguing and demanding for that don't have to defend the way that they do things at all. They don't have to bring the same amount of effort and information to the table. And to me, Again, I always try and flip it to the other side of the coin. Well, if that's expected of me, again, we're going to have a professional conversation. Then let's put it all on the table. So you speak equally to your side and I speak equally to my side. And then we should be able to discern which one is more effective and what we should use. But I feel like it's always put on the person that wants to bring something different to defend and prove what they want. And the people that are on the other side of the table, all they have to say is, well, this is what I like and I'm going to keep doing it. The burden of proof is on us and... It kind of comes with the territory on we got to have our argument ironclad and airtight. And if we don't, they're going to use that one little spot that didn't quite measure up. And you, that little stutter of you maybe not saying it exactly confidently. And they're going to use that against you. And don't just come with problems. If you're going to be a naysayer, come with the solution. And don't tell me my way doesn't work if you're not telling me the way that does. And I can agree to that, that it's a two-way street. And if you're going to tell me my way doesn't 
work or it will never work. Show me what does. Because that's all we're looking for. We're looking for what does, right? And I've said time and time again, if this is what I do right now, but if you show me something that's better, I will drop it and I will change right now. I will do the different thing because that's all I care about. I only know what I know at this moment. Show me something different and I'll make the change. And I think as long as we all have that approach, then whatever the thing that comes, we can have a proper discussion about it and just do what's better and as opposed to getting our egos involved. Exactly. And at the end of the day, I feel we all want to do a good job. And I think personalities, being type A personalities does interfere with sometimes those discussions being had out. And you know, for sure, I think it's crew dependent, it's personality dependent, but there's going to be those guys that you're just never, no matter what you do, no matter what facts you bring up, they're just never going to want to see it. Maybe because you just, you as a person rubbed them the wrong way. And to me, those are those battles I wish I would have won on the early end. And I try to take ownership of it on my part instead of putting it on them. But I think the truth of the matter is it's somewhere in the middle and everybody being grown ups and professionals and wanting to be receptive of maybe something different. And for me, like the spot I'm in now is I couldn't ask for a better support network and the guys on my crew, the other firefighters to my officer, to the captain on the ladder, to their crew and to my chief, like to my shift commander wanting to be open minded and hey man, send me that paper you wrote or send me some information. I'd like to hear more about it. To me that's those are wins and, and those are moves in the right direction and I feel like we're winning so much lately that it's better to just take ownership of where I was wrong and not so much throw it at blame it on other people and because we are winning some of the people maybe that didn't see what we were saying before come up to me during fires excited and saying hey this worked or we did this and now we're talking a little bit more fire because for the longest time we weren't and for me those are wins too and it's not the only thing we do by no means but for me i felt like there was a void there at least let's start talking about more stuff and because i took a peek over the fence so to speak and I was like, man, I wanted to bring back these ideas and some of the stuff we were doing before, let's bring it back. And that excitement, and I think it just was received a little bit wrong. And knowing what I know now, I could have done it a little bit different. But like like I was saying too, there's some people that just didn't want to hear it, no matter what, didn't want to hear it. But the ones that do, those are the ones I'm there for, the ones that are in the position where it's going to benefit them, the ones with the most skin in the game, those are the ones... I'm always doing this for and wanted to make sure they're ready when the time comes. Yeah, that's the one gift of the naysayers and the pushback is that it does make you better. It makes you do deeper research. It makes you understand things deeper. It makes you a better speaker. It makes you look at people dynamics and personalities and how to approach things with tact. Like All of that challenge really does make you a better person. It's not a really enjoyable way to go through it, but really nothing worth doing is ever enjoyable anyway. So it's growth, right? So they are kind of part of helping us be better. I guess what I'm saying is I just wish they would understand that this isn't coming from me. When you're talking to people, this isn't coming from, I didn't create this. I didn't come up with this. This isn't about me. This is something that is out there that has been proven to work. And I would just like us to look at it. I think that's what we're looking for. Something that I gain so much comfort in, and I probably read this quote four years ago, was The Man in the Arena by uh, FDR. The Man in the Arena, it's not the critic that counts, or the naysayer, or the one that criticized the doer of deeds and where he could have done them better. It's the man in the arena that counts. It was a great quote, and then talking about how those poor souls that know neither success or, or defeat, he felt sorry for them, the guys that are out there doing it. They're the ones that matter, not the ones that are on the sidelines critiquing them and seeing where they failed. And I took so much comfort in that. I was like, man, okay, it's okay. I mean, laugh at me all you want for toe tapping and flowing and moving and whatever. But I kind of just took a lot of comfort and solace in that it's okay to fail. And it's okay to be the one out there sticking your neck out to be made fun of. And because at the end of the day, I was doing the right thing. And the right thing still the right thing no matter what. And that quote really resounded with me. I know it's kind of been shared a lot here and there, but when I found it, I was like, man, this is this is spot on. In order to make mistakes, you got to be in the game. You can't get hurt on the sidelines. The guys that are out there doing it are the ones that are going to make mistakes. And you got to be 
okay with making mistakes and that's the only way you learn and that's the only way you get better and you can't learn from other people's mistakes you can learn from them but it's not going to really hit you the same way the mistakes that you make are the ones that are going to bring about the most change and i sincerely feel like that they say smart guy learns from other people's mistakes that's true but i think the most genuine experiences or changes in someone's life are learned through making your own mistakes and learning from them and bringing about a real change and a real growth in a person. Yeah. Those failures and embarrassments, man, they stick with you. And I mean, I've embarrassed myself a lot along the way of trying to get better at certain things. And then I've had to learn to be better to myself in reflecting on those moments and be a friend to myself and how I talk myself through it and to keep myself going. And I almost find that there's this sweet spot between enough confidence to be excited and inspired in and of yourself to keep going and enough humility where it doesn't ever creep over into arrogance, where you just keep those embarrassments and failures just close enough not to beat you down into the ground where you just want to crawl into a hole and never come out. I feel like viscerally there's like this and emotionally there's this sweet spot of both together and that's where you keep working. And I think if you're ever going to think that you've achieved the pinnacle and all of a sudden you relax and, and then you're not in that hungry space anymore. I think failure is it's a part of the game. I know I talked about how the parking lot's the price of admission. Failure is the price of admission as well. In order to succeed, you have to fail and fail repeatedly and learn from those and get better. I'm a true believer in that. It's hard, man. You just, <laughs> I guess you just, we all want to have this specific ratio of wins and failures, and sometimes it's lopsided <laughs> in the wrong way, and it, it's hard to, to keep going, but that's where the work resides, right? That's where you got to dig deep and keep going. Our biggest critic is ourselves, too, man. And I went on a pretty big podcast, too, and I thought I bombed, and I did really horribly, and I, I made mistakes I didn't usually make. And I know I talked to you about it, and I was like, man, I thought I did horribly. But reality, I probably did, but maybe not as bad as I thought I did. And we learned from it. We learned how to gather our thoughts and how to push the information a little bit better. And those failures, so to speak, are what make us who we are and make us better and keep us humble, keep us grounded. Yeah, I think the more times we, just like instructing, right? The more times you get up in front of a class, like I remember the first recruit class I helped teach, they didn't get the A game. It was the fifth class or the sixth class, right? Like that's each class you teach, it gets better. And you wish you could go back and teach the first class, like the fifth class, but you can't. So you just have to get up and do it. And same thing with these conversations, right? The more times we have conversations and maybe we sound like a broken record on some points, but every time we talk about a point, we distill it down and hone it. And then when you deliver it for the 25th time and the f person hears it for the first time from you, they get it beautifully, but it took you fucking it up <laughs> 24 times before you said it in that perfect way. So I guess we just got to open our mouths and keep talking and hopefully some good stuff falls out on the way towards getting the proper message out. When I was the uh, lead instructor for uh, the first line class that we did, my first time going up to speak to everybody, I felt confident, but it didn't come across the way I wanted it to. And just through doing it more often, like you said, those fourth or fifth class where now I got the information, I got it exactly how I want to say it, and I want to make it to where it's palatable and, and be able to show all the passion that I have for what we do and Knowing the material, I think, for one, it has to be critical. And if you know the material, you you know, you'll at least formulate a good argument and a good way of presenting it. And it has to start there. I think sometimes it's it's good to be our own worst critic. And just like I talked about where guys that are professional see where maybe they were deficient, that goes a long way. Like, I don't need to call them out. And I think that call out culture, so to speak, could be really, really toxic and I'd like to stray away from that. Yeah, I think if you've spent a lot of time on something and then you have someone in front of you that has spent zero time on it, it's completely unfair. It's like, again, using the analogy, my daughter's riding a bike or I'm going to teach my daughters to drive eventually. If I've been driving for 35 years, it's not fair of me to harp on them about not being perfect day two of them driving. That's that understanding of where you came from and how long it took you and how long it's going to take other people. And, and then I think it just, yeah, it removes all that ego out of it and it just becomes about the thing you're doing. And it comes across in a much more natural, authentic, and genuine way. And 
I think if people then can't receive that, I think that's their problem on their end. But I think that's what we're striving for on our end. Oh, yeah. I think learning is a two-way street. There's been times where I'm instructing or I'm showing a probie or a rookie something and I'm explaining maybe something and they set it back because human beings were smart, intuitive people and they'll say something back that I was trying to explain, but they explained it even better in simpler terms because they understood what I was trying to say. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start using that from now on if you're okay with it. And they're like, well, yeah. And it's like, that just made better sense. And so those are things to keep in my pocket. And it's an ongoing process of getting better and the information getting channeled in a better, more palatable fashion that other people understand and maybe they'll connect with. As you've learned more through your experience and in teaching and uncovering the things you don't know in certain other areas and reflecting back on all of that and reflecting on how this process moving forward has helped you grow as a person. Like how has that also then changed how you view your mental health and the way you talk to yourself and the way you, your self care, how has that changed? It's okay to be not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And I used to feel like, man, I'm lacking in this certain area or I, I could be doing better. Or I'm, I'm not up to par with other people or nobody is without regrets. Nobody's without fault. Everybody has a little bit of fault. We all make mistakes. And I used to harp so bad on the individual mistakes and beat myself up over and I kind of grow a little bit and knowing that, hey, if I was trying my best and nobody got hurt and I can resolve the issue, the mistake isn't maybe as bad as, as I think. And I can always fix my mistakes as long as we're attentive and and learn from them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's helped me tremendously to know that it's okay to not be okay sometimes and it's okay to make mistakes. And for me, that's helped a lot. And I'd be lying if I said I was perfect now. Nobody's perfect. And I think being more comfortable in that skin and knowing that I'm not perfect has helped me. But that doesn't mean I want to stay there either. I'm constantly every day 1% better and trying to get better and moving in the right direction is has helped me honestly get through a lot of hard times and has helped me a, a lot in my life. And I would recommend that for everybody is like, it's okay to not be okay sometimes and nobody's perfect. We're all imperfect assholes, so to speak. And the minute somebody claims they're perfect, I call bullshit. Nobody's without fault. That's helped me tremendously. Even physically for body awareness, like has the flowing and moving and getting into these techniques, it has to have because it's been my experience personally, so I'm, I'm just assuming it's been yours as well. It has to have helped you get to know your body better and how it moves and how it might be able to move if you work on your mobility better or your strength more in certain areas. Has it been a window into your own body's ability and what you can do to improve it? And then I guess that the two-parter would be mentally getting into this game differently and approaching it differently has to then have been a real mental shift for you too. Like, how do I stay more relaxed as I get off the truck? How do I stay more focused when I'm on the call? How do I tap into these skills better by keeping myself calm as I possibly can and focus? So maybe, I know it's a two-part question, but what I'm trying to frame here is that the the drilling and skills really have like a, a physical awareness that brings up and also a mental awareness that brings up and then what you do with those two things. I think getting those muscle memories and making things automatic has helped relieve some of the stress of the call. It, and it's, it brings about that sense of familiarity where this isn't the first time I've done it. So, and then it's not the only way I know how to do it. Like, for example, last fire we had, I didn't do a hip grip. I didn't do a Camella. <laughs> I did a New York shuffle. You know, I, just the position I found myself into and we were able to do it because it wasn't the first time I've done it. And I went from a clamp, we had to adjust the pressure, and once we got the pressure right, I, I went back and found myself in a New York shelf for whatever reason, and that familiarity with those positions brought about, like, there was no raise in stress, like, it was just, okay, this is just another day in the park, and all the information, all the work done in the past, all the experience, knew that it's pretty crappy conditions, but I know that I, I got the nozzle on, I'm, I'm water mapping as best I could. I dropped the nozzle for head hunting, and I felt that uh, I was hitting a door. We blew that door open with the stream and immediately started feeling like things were getting better, and it was just like another day in the parking lot. So those guys that say it doesn't translate, 
I don't think they don't really know what they're talking about. But yeah, it's made me become more familiar. Like I told you, injuries have been compiling on. And the thing I've been doing as of late is the 100 burpee challenge. And I feel good every time I do it. And one of the things we talked about is my son leaving for the Marines. And he's gone for three months. And this is something I want to do like in solidarity with him on top of other, the other workouts I do is 100 burpees every day without fail. Do them. And I feel good keeping myself honest with them. And I felt like they've helped me already with going to fires and being a little bit more mission focused too with the training we do. And it all compounds on each other. And like I said, I'd be lying if I said I was perfect. And, but it, it's helped for sure. And, and the training pays dividends. And just like I said, with the last fire and the fire before, we don't always go in with our knees. You know, we, we practice flowing and moving, standing up. Far before last, I was standing up. Conditions were all in the attic, and they just kept deteriorating and blew the attic open with the stream, the ceiling open, and started making a good impact. And that knowledge base and the technique to back it up and muscle memory compounding on each other just really, really pays dividends. And it has helped me become more familiar with my body. I think we've talked about messed up ankles and blown shoulders and that longevity of making sure we keep moving every day and breaking the sweat every day and for me that's paid off already and I don't ever want to look back I want to keep doing this as long as I can and I think that's the best way to do it is to stay fit yeah I guess we never really know what bad mobility is until we feel what mobility feels like we don't know what being unfit feels like until we're fit right and then you've got that new baseline like you've expanded your mind you can't go back and Mentally, this works too, right? You don't know what balance and calm feels like until you've felt it, right? Until you're in the middle of the abyss and it's 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 hot and it's not the first time you planned you you prepared yourself mentally, physically for for those situations and being able to perform in those situations is pretty awesome in my opinion. And coming out and preparing for success and being successful, man, to me, there's no better way of feeling fulfilled. And that's what I would say is. I do have this just this big wave of fulfillment right now because we've been going a lot of fires lately. And since I've been here at this station, even before at my other house that I was at, pretty busy house, just honing those skills, honing those skills to where being brilliant in the basics to where even if my go-to doesn't go right, I still have, I can lean on these other basics and we can still kick the fire and, and lean on those other basics for sure. Do you find that the baseline skills that have become second nature, it's more of the fact that it makes you aware of when you're off balance, when you're not in the right position. It's more about because of the variables within actual structures, right? The corners we're going to encounter, the debris we're going to encounter. But now you have this foundation to realize I'm off balance. I need to be back in this position and you can reset and you can reset and you can reset. You feel like that's more of the benefit than knee dropping perfectly 15 times down a hallway and putting a fire out being good in the basics and getting these reps in and i think it breeds about some familiarity in an unfamiliar environment that we go into i'm familiar in this position and or in these techniques or just emotionally something we don't really touch on a whole bunch but emotionally like we probably all been in situations where your hair is standing in the back of your neck and i wish i would have worked on this a little bit more or I lost orientation with the wall I was doing a search or whatever and the nozzles just doesn't feel right in my hand right now or whatever what the training does breed familiarity when you're going into an unfamiliar environment and for me that's a game changer being prepared and we're not going to be able to be prepared on everything but if we're prepared on the basics like I feel comfortable going into any structure as long as because we've worked on how to be successful yeah, and if you've thrown a ladder a hundred times, then when you meet three or four different variables on the call, you're going to be able to adapt to whatever they are. That's the adapt and overcome, and the every fire is different. It's not the dismissal of, well, why practice that technique because every fire is different. It's like, well, practice these techniques because there's a lot of differences to some fires, and you'll have a foundation for when you go to them. One of the critiques I got from, there were good guys too, saying that all the variables in counter, you can't just speak with the sweeping statement of tax should come first and 99%. And yes, fires are different, but I feel like they're more the same than they are different. 
us one box leading to another box and different arrangements. And as long as we own the box we're in and move in before we move into the next box, I think we're going to be successful. And as long as we're, we're sound and being able to do that, the nozzle position is where the rubber meets the road. That's where we gain traction on the whole event. We can better plan to be successful. And as long as we understand that, and that's not to say that pump operator position is not important or the water supply or the surge or all the things that go on, the most hazard is usually the nozzle position because we get closest to the fire. And that's been my mission is how to make us do that the most effective and safest way possible. And learning from all these different living legends that are out there now, Kyle Ramagas being, for me, number one, is the guy that I look up to the most when in the fire service and I feel he doesn't get enough recognition, but to me, he's a man. I strive to be as good as him, uh, knowledge-wise, and he's like an encyclopedia, and and he's a guy I'm trying to to strive to be like, for sure. It's a never-ending process, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a process where we feel like we've gotten there. It's a never-ending process. you got to keep working through the techniques and keep studying and keep reading and re rehash and revisit the stuff you've gone over because it's easy to forget if you haven't looked at it in a while and it happens shoot i forgot one of andy's the title of one of andy's articles <laughs> it happens i knew the material i know the material back and forth but an article i forgot and i was so embarrassed and i couldn't believe it but the training aspect of what we do is that's how we become competent and i know we've touched on that before and i couldn't attest to that enough one of the coolest things about the fire service to me and about discovering people and where things come from is, is the lineage, right? It's, it is the acknowledgement of someone discovers you, right? And then you lead them to, to Kyle or lead them to Aaron and that leads them to Andy or you, you lead them to Andy. Like, it's just so cool for people to go down the rabbit hole and find out the arc of where all this information came from and, And I think it just gives it even more validity. And if you're romantic at all about the fire service, it's very cool about that passing down of information and where we came from and where we are today. It's just, it's a really cool aspect of of the fire service in general. Yeah, I just love what you're doing, as many of us have been about promoting what Andy did. And I'm sure Andy would then say, well, yeah, but there's all these other names you don't know about too that I got stuff from too, right? It goes he would have a lineage beyond him that we that we could learn from. So it's just really cool to see that arc that goes all the way back through and connects us to those people. I'm a student of history, and uh, for me, it, it's it's endearing. Like, I, I hold things pretty close to my heart, and Andy's done so much for us, and I couldn't pay the man enough respect. And, like, I, I try to honor his legacy for sure. Every time I step onto the fire ground or in the training room or whatever we do, like, it's constantly in my head, the things that he's done and promoted and put at the forefront of our psyche. All the stuff about nozzle work and engine that comes from him. Quickly deploying and advancing the initial attack line is the single most effective life-saving action a fire department can perform. Boom. He said that. It just wasn't until I started repeating it, people felt a certain way about it because maybe, and it wasn't only that, like it was backed with all this information that I totally agreed with it and I do couldn't thank Andy for what he's done enough. And even the Camella position that we, that we attribute to Jay Camella, he told us, he said that he got it from Andy, Andy Fredericks. So like, it's right that we, we got to give Andy credit for that too. Like it's on video of him saying that. And I think it's only right that maybe we look at adjusting that position to kind of honor him or at least give him some credit for it. You got to call it the commandy or something. <laughs> <laughs> you can steal that. You can steal that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to know your thoughts. So since we're here, I'd like to know your thoughts. If you don't want to put this on the final edit, that's cool. But I, I really like to know your thoughts. So I started the page, uh, Andy Frederick's Ghost, and it seemed to have gotten a rise out of certain people. Other people think it sounds good or it's not uh, demeaning or detracting from his legacy. Anybody that knows me knows how endearing Andy is to me and know that I try to honor his legacy by work. People get upset about things very easily now. And I think the one thing you said that really stands out and answers the question for me and for you, I think as well is where your intentions coming from, right? Like it's coming from a place of respect and love and admiration and, and wanting to continue that message and that legacy and give credit where credit's due. So no part of me 
ever saw it and took it in the wrong way. But I just think it's super easy for people to harp on things and do that call out culture attitude and and just make make a big deal out of something. Personally, I think if it was someone of his family members that weren't cool with it, I think I would give it more due. But if it's anybody other than them, I think it's we all know where it's coming from. So I'm glad you're doing it. Thank you, man. And I just wanted your thoughts. You're a level-headed dude, and I, I just found it odd. It was more than one person, and I think if it was somebody that maybe wasn't trying to do his name justice or trying to make money off of, which I'm not doing, they're just trying to pay homage to him. And I got the idea, and I, I like saying where I got the idea for the name because for me it's it's just as sincere and just as a beloved person as Andy, but in a different realm. I got it from another page that I'd followed for a while called um, Chesty Puller's Ghost. So me being a Marine, Chesty Puller is the Marine's Marine, the quintessential forefather of the modern Marines and came up with the rifle team and the most decorated Marine of all time, beloved by all of us. And in boot camp, you're kind of taught, hey, good night, Chesty, wherever you are. And there was a page called Chesty Puller's Ghost. And back then, Marines were really good with it and still are. And I kind of borrowed the name from that for a beloved way to pay homage to, to somebody that's that well loved and respected and never meant it to be disrespectful uh, by no means. And one of their family members or somebody that worked really closely with him maybe took offense. Then I'd for sure look at changing it and doing something like that or altering it. For sure, I would. But I think even in that case, if they saw the content, I think anybody that was close to him would give you the space to explain, right? And I think this is what we're missing in general in society now is people just want to instantly jump to their assumptions and make claims and knock people down. And there's not a lot of conversation and room for people to explain themselves and just talk it out. Yeah, and I think that's what's wrong with society in general. We want to People like to judge in the court of public opinion and you know, maybe at first it was interesting to see how the general mass had power over maybe swaying a public decision or something like that. But it's gotten out of hand to where it's basically used as a weapon for for bad now. And, and it's it's such a toxic environment their families in and to live in. And you, know, you can't make mistakes anymore. And it goes to that tune. And you're right. People like to get upset now for everything. And goes towards that cancel culture that I think most people agree has probably found its time to be on its way out. Yeah, I think what we're doing is we're trying to achieve, and we've talked about it here in this this conversation we've had, is achieve the middle ground, right? Like it's to say that we shouldn't be trying to remove toxic things from our culture. It doesn't need to go all the way to the extreme. Like there is there's a middle ground and to saying that we shouldn't be calling things out doesn't mean we shouldn't call anything out right there's obviously good people are going to speak up against things that aren't right and we should always be having conversation to try and and find what the middle ground is and what is truly right as opposed to being more and more divisive as thinking that my way of thinking is the only way of thinking and i'm righteous and virtuous and you are not in the middle somewhere and i learned that with politics early on in my college career my college days of the truth being in the middle and the law of averages usually wins not usually it always wins and no one way is always right or wrong it's usually in the middle somewhere and that's a big thing i i feel like i've learned and the truth is usually in the middle somewhere jordan peterson talks about how the left and the right need each other right they're there they exist for a reason and i think that's the goal is the pendulum if it swings too far one way or the other it's not good it's all about the balance, right? And then, I mean, we try and obviously draw parallels to what we're dealing with in, in the fire service, but the fire service really is just, uh, we think we're incredibly unique and removed from the rest of society, but we're just a smaller facet of what society is experiencing. So we're experiencing the exact same thing. And and then even in the discussions that we're having here about trying to bring things forward and people wanting to dismiss it, I think things can swing too far one way or the other. So again, if we're just having conversation and we want to hear each other out and give us give each other room to explain and understand, I think we're always going to be in the right place. But we've lost a lot of that skill of conversation. And I, and I guess that's one of the reasons why I love doing this, because it allows for that space of people to just sit down and focus and have a talk. 
there's a place where you can't ask questions. It's usually a big red flag, and I think it, questions should always be on the table and two-way street of conversation and explanation. And that's always been big for me. I find that if you can't ask questions in a discussion, that's a big red flag. I'd always love and welcome for people to ask me to explain, right? I'd, I'd rather be given the 10, 15, 20 minutes to explain my position on something fire related or not, than people just assume that I think the way I think and make a judgment on me. Yeah. They can avoid a lot of misunderstanding just by having that dialogue, asking questions. Well, I appreciate you, man. I'm glad we had an opportunity to talk again. I appreciate you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. And if there's anything I could do, man, let me know. Yeah, man, I'll get all healed up and we'll, uh, I'll take you up on that offer of coming down and uh, flowing water with you. And that's what I'm on my bucket list now. We need to do it for sure. Okay, man, be well. Have a safe rest of your shift, eh? Thank you. All right, take care, bro. You too.